Can I start, Christine? Yes, I am sorry. I will do your introduction. So today we have um, with us Dr. Um, Cirilini Fernandez Lazaro. So Dr. Lazaro has a bachelor and a master's in animal science from the Federal University of Minas Gerais and a PhD in animal science from the Federal University of Vicosa. She currently holds a, holds a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guelph under the supervision of Dr. Flavio Schenkel, working with um, genetic evaluation for the survival of Canadian lambs. Dr. Lazaro has knowledge and experience in genetics, genomics, animal breeding, and statistical analysis. She worked with quail, pigs, beef cattle, and dairy buffalo, focusing on random regression models, genomic growth, lactation curves, sensor data, and programming in R, BASH, and Fortran. Um, during her PhD, she was a visiting student at the University of Zaragoza um, in Spain. Dr. Lazaro worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Sao Paulo State University with a visiting scholarship at Purdue University and as a press professor of genetics and animal breeding at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, Sao Paulo State University, and Jaguar Yuna University. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Lazaro. I'll give the floor over to you. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation, Chris and Samela. So <clears throat> let's start. I will talk about uh, a bit. I will talk a bit about my research project during my visiting postdoctoral period at Purdue University in Indiana, US, which resulted in this paper, uh, Genomic Studies of Milk-Related Trait in Water Buffaloes, Bubalis, Bubalus Bubalis, based on single-step genomic best linear unbiased prediction and random regression models. So uh, I did here um, a brief summary about this presentation. Uh, I will do so, a brief introduction, um, the objectives of this paper, materials and, met and methods, results, and modeling lactation curves, and some key, key messages. So, uh, I will be begin by explain, explaining to you about buffaloes and why studies on these spe species are important. Buffaloes come from Asia, so more specifically uh, about the Indian and forward to an um, of the world. The world buffalo population has reached uh, over two, 205 million individuals. They are used for both meat and milk production. So, sorry. Okay. So, this species introducing in Brazil about uh, 1870, uh, first uh, arrived on the Marajó Island in Pará state of the north of the Brazil. In this state, we have now approximately 70, 70 50,000, 300 animals and the largest herd in the country. So this state, the Pará, it's here in the north of the, the Brazil. Uh, they, the buffaloes are used for both and milk production, but sometimes can be used to as a service, like in these pictures. Here I just show you about the main breeds of the buffaloes. We have here Carabao, 
uh, most used to meat production. Muha breed, it's a uh, main breed used in milk production. In this paper, principally, we use this breed. So Mediterranean and Jafarabad as also as used to milk production. So the some people uh, asking if the buffalo why the difference between buffaloes and cattle. So the buffalo and cattle from the same family bovide, but this these two species belong to the different groups. We have here group group bovine for cattle and two groups for buffaloes, group bubalino and sincerina. The bubalino group uh, conduct to origins the domestic buffaloes, like a river buffalo and swamp buffaloes. The river buffaloes it's, for example, uh, Muha and Jafarabad and Mediterranean. And the example for swamp buffalo, we have the Carabao. And the Sincerina group, we have the white buffalo. Um, the, in addition, to have and propose, the buffaloes also can differ in the number of chromosomes. The river buffalo, like Muha, Mediterranean, and Jafarabad, have 50 chromosomes, and swamp, swamp buffaloes, like Carabao, have 48 chromosomes, while cattle have a higher number of chromosomes with 60 chromosomes. Um, um, in what captured our attention about these animals? So, uh, in the world, we have approximately 205 million head of buffaloes. So, buffaloes are widely distributed and contributed significantly to the world's livestock population. And in addition, we have 11% uh, of the world's total buffalo milk production. When we think about it, the milk production in the world, 11% is from buffalo production. And uh, buffalo farms, plays a significant role in the Brazilian economy, like maybe be at, maybe attributed to various factors, including the production of buffalo milk, which is used in their in their industry, like a buffalo mozzarella, and the production the average production milk yield in Brazil is about uh, 1,500 to 4,500 liters. When you think about it, um, cattle and buffaloes, why the dif what the difference between this production? So the protein and fat and A vitamin between cows and buffaloes, it's uh, in dairy buffalo, we have higher production in protein and fat yield and a high amount of A vitamin. So another difference between their, their cattle and dairy buffaloes, it's from the yard milk. And uh, we have in the dairy buffaloes, we have a higher cheese yield and we have a low 
amount car 10 and uh, I'll, even though we have more percentage of fat, the milk of buffalo, it's less cholesterol content. So because the less carotene in the buffaloes, we have the whiter milk when compared to dairy milk, dairy cattle. So uh, for the more, uh, despite these all factors, current daily buffalo productive below desired levels. So the main breeding goals are milk yield, content, lactation persistence, and udder health. And how can we achieve that goals? We can use some mathematical function to describe the physiological chains. And com one alternative would be uh, genetic evaluation based, based on test day records and random regression models. And combine these, evol these genetic evaluations with genomic information. Uh, since this kind of uh, evaluation also limited uh, in nowadays compared to other species. So, however, studies utilizing genomic information have been gained prominence recently, reiterating the importance of such research for this species. Here are some main goals of this study. Assess genetic parents using random regression models and a single step to blood approach. Investigate accuracy and bias of genomic estimated breeding values, GBVs. Explore time dependent effect of SNPs. Identify candidate genes in Muha daily buffaloes. For this, uh, we have materials and method, methods, and uh, I split this in five subsections like phenotypic and pedigree data set, genomic data sets, statistical analysis, GBV accuracy and bias, and for last, the was and functional analysis. So the phenotypic and pedigree data set. We have uh, 323,140 test record, test day record between five to 305 days in milk. This, this data set from Animal Science Department of uh, University of Sao Paulo State in Jaboticabal, Sao Paulo, Brazil. We used the first three lactations from five, four hundred fifty, five, sorry, four thousand five hundred eight eighty moha buffaloes. The pedigree was com composed about eight animals, 8,000 animals from 16 generations. This data set was collected from 1987 to 2017. Uh, we split this data set are split in six herds in Brazil from north, northeast, and southeast of the Brazil. Uh, Ceará, 
and Rio Grande do Norte and São Paulo State. So um, we do some steps for quality control, consisted of removing animal records with no birth or calving dates, and lactations with less than three test day records or with the first test day after 70 days postpartum. Or, or, was removed. Sorry. This was done because the lack of test day record before 70 days in milk could affect the estimation of lactation peak, which is paramount for modeling lactation curves. So only test day records within the range of five and uh, 305 days in milk were considered. And the contemporary groups were composed of herd, calving year, and calving season. Um, this calving season split, it of, split it in October to March and April to September, like a dryer and uh, so the genomic data set, the quality control was carried out using a soft plink and a total we started with uh, 978 animals uh, uh, genotyping using the array with 90k action buffalo genotyping. And this kind of array has um, 123,040 SNPs. So after the quality control, we, we remained for 45,690 auto, autosomous markers and 960 animals. These 906 animals, 748 are female, female and uh, two 2012 are male. So the statistical analysis, we have the main statistical model. Uh, this model we use it to both uh, kind of analysis, like you use it to uni, uh, unitrate and B variate analysis. So uh, first, the while is a vector of phenotype test the records for each trait, like a milk yield, fat yield, protein yield, or somatic cell scores. And when he, we analyze the, the bitrate analysis, the while uh, is a vector for one trait recorded at two different or two traits in the same part, like uh, milk yield from first and second lactation. Uh, milk yield in first and third lactation, or the combining milk yield with fat yield. So the vector, the effect are the same for all the analysis. The better vector, the better are vectors of systematic effects 
and eight is a vector of com contemporary groups as random effect. A is a are vectors of additive genetic coefficients. P are vector of permanent environment coefficients, and E are is a vector of residual coefficients. So X, Z, W, and Q are the incidence matrices relating to relating beta, A, P, and A to Y. So for this statistical analysis, we use the Gibbs Tree F9 program, and uh, we use the 5,000 cycles and uh, burning of 2,000 cycles and a sample interval of 50 cycles. Um, the approach of this analysis using a um, single step develop, we insert in this matrix some parentheses like who was added to 0 0.595 to of G and uh, 0 0.05 of A inverse 2, 2, because uh, we try to obtain the better account of the re reduced genetic variance and different pedigree depth. So we used the different tau and different omega parentheses uh, as a sky, scale factors. So we used some six different parameters for tau and five different parameters for omega. And uh, after previous analysis, the best combinations of tau and omega parameters for each trait was chosen according to to GABV, across and bias. So the G inverse as a genomic relation matrix, A inverse is a traditional relation matrix, and A inverse 2, 2 as a inverse of the section of A related to genotyped animals and tau and omega as the scaling factors. For the genomic prediction of breeding values, we, after we tested some combinations of tau and omega, we obtained this sum results about uh, for each trait. So here is the better combination for each trait. So like in for milk yield, we have the combination 0 0.5 to tau and 0 0.3 to omega. For fat yield, we have 0 0.3 to tau and 0 0.5 to omega. For Protein yield, we have the same values for tau and omega. And for somatic cells, we have uh, 0 0.3 to tau and 0 0.6 to omega. We, we observed the better uh, accuracy and the bias more close to one. And these values were used for estimated the genetic parameters for each trait and uh, each analysis.
the generic, the additive generic effect of random regression coefficients were used to divide, divide the GABV for its daisy milk and for its trait. The vectors of GABV for all daisy milk of each animal were obtained by this equation, where the I forgot this name. This component as a vector of the predicted genomic coefficients for each animal K trait L and lactation J. And the T as a matrix of the independent covariates for each daisy milk associated with the Legendre polynomials function. Uh, the across the GBV across and bias were, were obtained using this equation where the while equal EBV of the animals under validation and uh, B0 as an intercept coefficient, B1 as a regression coefficient, AR as GEBV or PA. PA is a parental average of the animals, animals and E as a residual. So in this equation, the B1 uh, was utilized as a bias in a genomic prediction and traditional evaluation. So the traditional evaluation were represented using the parental average. So after you did the, we did the regression, we, we did the person cor correlation between EBV and the parental average and the correlate person correlation between EBV and GEBV. So for the GEBV accuracy and bias, uh, a reduced data set was created from the full data set by excluding phenotype records from the last four years and it was used to predict the GABV and the parental average for the validation animals. So uh, to assess the genomic prediction bias or for example, the inflation or deflation of the set sorry, of the GBV related to EBV, regression coefficient B1 were estimated use, using this linear regression for daily EBV and daily GBV for each trait. The prediction across and bias of the GBV were compared with the pedigree-based generic evaluation, like a parental average. Thus, the validation across and regression coefficients were also calculated using the daily parental average and daily EBV for the animals, animals in the validation population estimated based on the reduced and full data set. For the, after calculating the GBV, we used the, the full data set, the post, we used the, the full data set in the post GSF9 software for back to solve the GABV predicted from the 
additive genomic random regression coefficients for the SNP effect. So the SNP effect calculated for the regression coefficients were used to estimate the SNP effect throughout the lactation curve from 5 to 35 days. And the SNP effect were ranked according to the magnitude of their daily effects, considering all the daisy milk in the same ranking for each trait and lactation. We estimated the average, average of the daily SNP effect for three different, three different uh, states of the lactation, like uh, stage one, from five to seven days in milk, second stage from 71 to 150 days in milk, and stage three from 151 to 305 days in milk. Why we did it? Because uh, we have a lot of SNPs, significant SNPs. So um, for the explain better the, the behavior of these SNPs, we divided the in three different lactation states. So for the relevant SNPs, we considered the 0 0.5 explanation uh, about the genetic variance. Uh, then assign assign the SNPs to the most likely clusters based on the patterns of this average I told before. And these clusters were split in five clusters, like uh, C1, we considered the constant SNP effect over time, C2, SNP effect increases over time, C3, SNP effect decreases over time, C4, SNP effect increases in the middle of the lactation, and C5, SNP effect decreases in the middle of lactation. And for the, the find the, the main candidate genes, we use the reference genome UOA double B1 for candidate genes associated with the important genes. Now I will present some results split in four sections, irritability estimates, generic correlation estimates, genome predicts of breeding values, DWOS and functional analysis. So the irritability estimates for each trait and each lactation uh, are showing in this table. And we have here the, the number of, we have summarized here the number of records for each trait and in each lactation and uh, the number of animals were provide this information. And here we have some irritability for each trait. And we can see here the, the irritability rendered the moderate to higher irritability, the moderate it's a uh, second lactation for somatic cells, cells sorry, and uh, the higher irritability to protein yield in second lactation. So it suggests that 
there is sufficient additive genetic variability to obtain substantial genetic gains in any of the trait analyzed. So here I I wanted to show uh, the behavior of the irritability over the lactation. So we have here the similar patterns of irritability to three lactations in milk yield and the higher irritability um, and the in and the higher irritability in the final portion of the the lactation curve. So this is one the one of the advantage of the random regression models because you can see the irritability uh in each point of of the your interval so now the estimates of generic correlation at different days in milk and for milk fat and protein yield and stomatic cell score obtained by bitrate regre random regression models between different traits from test day records in Muha buffaloes. So the genetic correlation estimated uh, in general were the highest at lactation peak and towards at the end of lactation. So um, higher in the lactation peak, it's about six days and uh, in the portion in the final portion of the, the curve. So we can see here uh, after the 2070 days, the irritability decreasing. And this period, uh, it's a, when it start the drier period in a female buffalo. So the same behavior were observed in a generic correlation between the differing the different lactations. So in the same trait but different lactation. Um, the genetic correlation between different lactations rendered from moderate to higher close to the peak of the lactation and towards the end of the lactation and start decreasing when the drier period start in the animal. Here we have the genomic prediction of breeding values. So accuracy measured by person correlation coefficients estimated between estimated breeding values and the genomic estimated breeding values and between EBVs and parent average, the regression coefficients for GBV with EBVs and for EBVs and P for milk, fat, protein, and somatic cell scores in, Muh in Muha buffaloes. So the accuracy estimated were considered of the of a moderate to, to higher magnitude, so above 50, 60. The values of the B, G, B, V, or the bias for G, B, V, that indicate in flash inflection or deflection were close to one. So for the PA, the for the PA across for the first three and combinate combinated lactation range from 
0.53 to 0.87 to second lactation for protein yield. And for genomic GBVs, we have the range between 0 0.56 to 0 0.77 uh, milk yield second lactation and protein yield second lactation. Where is the regression coefficients rendered from 0 0.60? A 68, sorry, for milk yield second lactation to 0 0.97 for milk yield in third lactation. And uh, for GBV, we have 0 0.96 for fat yield in second lactation and 1.18 uh, for protein yield in second lactation. So uh, this uh, the accuracy from GBV and PA it's close, but the each other. But the bias when you use the GBV it's more close to one than when you use just the parental average. I summarized here uh, some candidate genes were identified for all traits, like for milk yield, SLC2483 plays an important role in extrude calcium and potassium ions outside of the cells by entry of so sodium ions. The M TRR that regu regulate the innate adapted adapted adaptive immune response response and thermal tolerance in ruminants and uh, MAPK TAM as involved is involved in cell migration, inflammation, stress responses, and apoptosis. For the fat yield, we have ID81 uh, that uh, plays in a NADPH regeneration and regulation of phospholipids process, um, fat X acid synthesis, and we have two CFAP. 73 place bovine milk cholesterol content and TPM4 place fat acid composant in dairy cattle. And for somatic cell score or mastitis, we have LIPG play, uh, that encodes and in the end endothelial lipase and is a member of the triglycerides lipase family. It also has an important role in an inflammatory response. And GREM1 plays cell proliferation and anti-inflammatory functions. And here, uh, just uh, a brief results about uh, another paper uh, by this partnership with the um, um, Brazil University and Purdue University is uh, like a complementation of this this first study uh, I that I present for you. So here we included additional important traits for buffalo production, like uh, mozzarella, 
and um, lactation length and fat protein fat to protein ratio and uh, we used alternative mathemat mathematical functions such as wood or mink and Alice Schaefer. So here you can see the, the range of irritability to lactation length when you use a um, rep repeat repeatability model and when you use uh, we consider the lactation length as a multiple trait model. So the editability is so similar uh, between these two models. And here we have the across and bias for the different traits in and the different mathematical function used in these studies. So uh, some key message about the breeding in dairy buffaloes. We have some challenge like a small size of most herds and their spread geographical location across the country low adaptation of reproductive technologies such as artificial insemination, lack of large scale phenotyping scams, routine and novel traits and pedigree recording, genotype and genotype costs. So we have some opportunities too, like uh, increase of increased demand for increased demand for buffalo milk and meat and byproduct in Brazil and around around the world. Buffalo production is also increased in another Latin American countries and Brazil is exporting animal animals to most of them due to the large national herds located in a strategic areas. And uh, there is enough genetic variability for milk related trait reproduction growth, reproduction growth conformation and other health like uh, we, we saw in this presentation. And uh, this contribute to genetic progress can be active for all these traits. And genomic inbreed levels are low. Low. And uh, most traits are highly polygenic, uh, moderately accurate and lowly by the genomic breeding values can be obtained. Some opportunity to reduce generic interval and increase generic progress. So genomic inbreed levels are low but increasing over time and the lactation curves can be modified through genetic and genomic selection, as in this new paper that uh, was uh, published in two months ago. So thank you for uh, your attention. And here is some partners uh, in these studies like uh, UNESP, University of São Paulo State, FAPESP, the support, financial support, and Purdue University. So here is my email. If uh, you would like some contact, uh, discuss something, I'm here. Thank you for the invitations, Samala and Christine. Okay.
thanks um, for the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hands or type them into the chat. Um, Flavia? Yes, uh, Selena, I have a question. Uh, so this uh, are small herds, AI is not used in buffaloes usually. So have you checked if the, the herds were connected, genetic, genetically connected? Uh, for this study, no, no. We... Yes. What, what would be the likelihood that they are disconnected? I don't know, Professor. Yeah, I think that is a very important uh, yes. aspect you have to check because then this will affect us. the the, par the genetic parameters will affect the EBVs, how you compare the EBVs, right? If they are disconnected, that will be troublesome. Uh, and another question that I have is we, we know from the, the past work when we start in, in, with dairy cattle, the hosting, for instance, that uh, when you don't have a large population of animals genotyped, in phenotyped, <laughs> that's exactly your, your case here. Um, when you do validation of the accuracy, because you have still a small data set, the validation is going to give you uh, accuracies that uh, you don't have advantage when you compare with the PA. Right, that usually is the case. Uh, but if you look at the theoretical reliabilities, then you're going to see a difference, right? Genomics is going to increase the, the accuracy. And that in proportional increase is maintained, you see later on when you can do a better validation, right? Not the absolute value, but the how much you gain. And that's going to repeat when you do a proper validation. Okay, so my question to you, why you didn't look at the theoretical reliabilities? Uh, yeah, in this, uh, this study uh, I are pre present here, so we didn't use the theoretical reliability, but in the new uh, paper, we used it the theoretical liability. So we saw a little bit difference, but uh, more in favor of the GBV. Yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. In that difference, that proportional difference, when you have a bigger data set to do a better validation, you're going to find that. Yeah. With small data sets, small number of animals, it's very important to look at the theoretical reliability. Yes. That will give an expectation when you can do the proper validation what you are going to find. Right? Yes, in the second study, uh, we we corrected the, some things uh, we didn't do in the first study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really suggest you to look at the correctness. I will. And I will talk with uh, the group in Brazil. It's a, a good suggestion. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sina. We have any other questions? Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned you did the GWAS. I was wondering, did you find any um, any um, genes that overlap with those that have been found to be important in uh, bee or in dairy? Yes, we find some, but uh, special in I forgot the the special gene in dairy milk. Uh, I forgot the name now, but uh, we didn't find this gene, but uh, we find some genes in the same region, this gene. So oh. I I didn't 
see, I didn't show this overlap here because we have had a lot of results and I tried to show the main genes yeah. uh, for each trait. Yes. Um, OK, Flavio, did you have another question? Or... Yeah. Uh, yes, the gut, the, the gene. Ah, yes, yes, yes. yes. I have another question. OK, <laughs> go ahead. My question is, um, Jillian, I, you can remember well the lactation curve of buffaloes is more alike the lactation curve of uh, zebu cattle. Uh, yes, right? a little, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not not more alike to the, uh, the Bostaurus, for instance, right? So um, my question for you, you never mentioned this. What was the order of the polynomial that you picked? For the run regression analysis? Uh, I used the, sorry, I didn't say, sorry. Uh, I used the three order for, for genetic effect and four for environment permanent, environment permanent. So we used this, this uh, ordered because uh, previous studies in the same population of our group in Brazil uh, did the regression analysis with these polynomials. So they tested another orders and uh, they saw this, this three and four. It's the better combination for this this population so uh so do you say order three you meant uh, quadratic mm. or uh, let's talk about degree or talk about order yes you, yes uh, yes quadratic three, yes two. quadratic yes zero quadratic. one two yeah quadratic for the genetic and uh, cubic for the environmental part Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious what was the order. Uh, I, I I forgot. Sorry, I didn't put here. Okay. Thank you. Um, Saranya, go ahead. Um, uh, I was wondering. Can you hear me? Yes, I yeah, can. I was one wondering if you were um, if you did check your validation method with the um, uh, Rivera and uh, sorry uh, Lagara and Roberta uh, method because in my study also when I have this small validation populations when I look at the validations using the uh, phenotypic correlation uh, the correlation it was low but when I used that other method it seems to be a little bit high when you do with a single step method. Did you check that with that uh, validation method? I, I, uh, in the first study, uh, I didn't use the Legar method. And in the second study, uh, I saw a little bit, I used the, the Legar method. And uh, as I saw, I told it, Professor Flavio, the when I used the Legarra method, uh, I saw the GBV. It's more accurate than just a pedigree evaluation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question, Sarenia. Okay, so that kind of that puts us at time. So thank you everyone that joined us today and thank you again, Dr. Lazaro for the amazing presentation. Um, we appreciate you putting together a presentation for us today. So thank you and see you all next week and have a nice weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.